Uh, bij deze geef ik het woord aan Albert Buizen. Fijne dag. Thank you and uh, good morning. Just to be sure, I'm starting off in English, but um, that was by uh, by request. I don't know if that request is still valid. Um, welcome. Um, before I'm going to start off talking about uh, CQRS and going uh, all big with uh, scalable architectures, uh, let me briefly introduce myself. I am a software architect at Trifork, which is a um, uh, software development company, uh, in, in my case, based in, uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, we have offices all around uh, Europe and some in the rest of the world. Um, I have around 15 years of uh, web development experience. That uh, might be a lot for some of you and very little for, uh, for some others. Um, and I, I have developed a very strong belief in domain-driven development and, and CQRS, especially that in the last, uh, last few years. Um, and I would like to share some of my experience here with you. Um, I do that in the form of, of presentations and, uh, and, and bashing some of the uh, existing architectures, as you will find out soon enough. Um, but also in the form of an open source framework, which I have uh, accidentally started uh, about three years ago. Uh, and I'm probably stuck to it for, uh, for quite a bit longer. When uh, we start a software development project and we do projects for customers, every project looks like this. Everything is simple. We like to simplify things to, for ourselves. I, th I guess that's the nature of a developer. Um, but as time progresses and as we start developing that software, we notice all these corner cases and all these exceptional situations that we have to um, uh, be careful about. In my example here, we, uh, we have an application, a very cheesy example, my apologies for that, um, of a, let's say, a web shop. And if you look at a web shop in a very basic and simple way, all you have is a customer who comes in and buys a product. And that's usually how customers come to our office. They say, well, I have a very simple project, because that's our way of getting the lowest price possible, obviously. But as you start uh, developing, you suddenly notice that it's, it, it's actually in practice a bit more complex than that. What we need is ju just an order, uh, not just a, a customer buying a product. There's this notion of an order, because a customer can buy multiple products. Well, it's a, as I said, it's a cheesy example, and this one is, is very obvious. But as time progresses, we notice that this, this model and all these, these entities that we are managing in our application, they start to grow beyond control. Who here is a software developer? Who has the, not had the similar experience? Oh, I, I almost thought somebody was raising a hand there. And so we all have this, this feeling that everything grows beyond, um, let's say, beyond our control to some extent. Yet, Every time I look at a software, uh, a piece of software, um, and as a consultant, I sometimes uh, have the chance to, to look at software that other people have built. We use the same or at least similar architecture in all of these applications. Who is familiar with the layered architecture? Who did not raise his hand? His hand? <laughs> I should have asked the other way around. Who is not familiar with the layered architecture? OK, good. Um, so, it's been around for quite a while, and um, I, I think it made its first appearance around in the, in the 70s, uh, when uh, distributed computing was, uh, was all hot, and uh, people were sitting in terminals, and the, the back of the terminal was, was huge in our current understandings. Um, but still, it's the, it's the major architecture we see in all applications. But the world since the 70s has changed, as we saw in the talk, uh, in the opening talk earlier. Um, why doesn't our architecture change as well? So we have this, this really procedural um, uh, model here, uh, where uh, user interface logic is put in, in, in a layer, and the data is in the bottom layer, and, and since we're not allowed to access data directly, we have to put a service layer in between. 
And in some cases, it's the service layer that holds all the domain logic, the business logic, and thus the business value. And in some other cases, it's the domain model that captures that. But still, it's really managed by this, this service layer. And an architecture like this doesn't scale very well. And in some cases, uh, it's hard to make it perform very well. So what do we do? We, we add some caches because we love technology and there's beautiful open source technology to speed up and, and make everything easier. Uh, so what do we do? We put a web cache, we put some, uh, some proxy servers in between. Um, we have, um, well, session replication because we, we don't want sticky sessions on our load balancer and we, we um, want to make sure that the user has a very nice experience regardless of switching servers between requests. Um, we, we put method invocation caches on, on, um, on, the, on the service layer. That's very simple nowadays. If you use a framework like the Spring Framework, all you need to do is put an annotation in your method. Bam, there you go. Cached. We're all done. It's not that much of work. Um, we start doing things asynchronously because it makes the user feel you respond really fast. But what he doesn't, doesn't know is that in the background, we're still processing his request or still doing something related to his request. So we have worker pools. And in the data access layer, we, we optimize our databases. We use a distributed second level cache because if we have an update on one server, we need to make sure we've got that information on the other servers as well. Otherwise, a user enters information and he doesn't see the information immediately on, on the next request. And finally, we have a query cache because some queries are really slow and if we execute them many times, what we need is a query cache so we can get the results faster. And when I was drawing this, this, this diagram, what really, really struck me is that the business value for the customer usually is in the domain model. And that's the only part where we don't seem to be optimizing anything. Those are just plain, in my case Java, but it could be any language, plain classes with some logic. But where are the optimizations in there? And to me, well, if you, if you want to find a picture that sort of resembles what we're doing in this case, um, yes, I'm guilty as well, so I can say what we are doing. It, it looks like you're buying a car and, and it, well, the car doesn't look really fast. Uh, so what we do is we put caches and spoilers and all sorts of extra things on it to make it seem really fast and maybe, no, it doesn't drive any faster than the original, I guess. Although the aerodynamics, no, probably not. But the engine is still the same. And, and you could say, well, it really depends on where the business value of a car is. Is that in the engine or is it in the, in the metal plating? Um, well, I think in this case, all business value is lost anyway. And if we look in, inside, um, um, inside our code, um, it, it might look like this. Uh, this is a feeling that a lot of, especially new hires, we, we all know the feeling we've got a project and it runs really great. And then this new guy comes in, and you have to explain him everything. And he opens up the code, and he doesn't understand anything he sees. Well, that's probably the feeling you get when you uh, are a new hire at this company, and just hear that the, next, uh, the network connection of server 23A is a bit faulty. Could you please fix that? Well, good luck. So I usually start off bashing this, this layered architecture, and, and I have to say it's, it's not bad in all cases. But what strikes me is that we use it by default. It is the default architecture for building a web application. So of course when you bash something, you have to introduce something that is supposed to be better. So here it is. It's called Command and Query Responsibility Segregation. I'm going to dive into it in a minute. The basic idea is that when we have an application, we have to dis distinguish between two types of activities on that application. The first one is changing the application state. And we do that in some component. And the other activity is querying the application state, getting information out of the application. 
And basically, if you have to draw an architectural diagram of CQRS, this is all you can draw. So it's rather simple, and it's a very basic uh, principle, and very easy to follow, because there's not much to it. Yeah, well, there's fortunately a bit more to it, uh, as you'll see in a minute. And what we can now do, if we have this, this separation uh, between application components, is we can split the logic into two parts. We can split the logic for executing commands. We can store that in a command model, where we make the decisions of uh, changes that a user wants to uh, perform. And on the other side, we can have a query model, sometimes also called a projection, where users can quickly retrieve information from the system. And by changing this into two models, so instead of having this one model that can answer all, all of your questions and do everything that you want, we can now really focus every model on ex exactly that one task that he is supposed to do and do that faster or better or more reliable, whatever your, wherever your business value is. So there's a number of advantages to, to applying this, uh, this concept. And I'm going through each one of them, uh, trying to uh, hopefully convince you uh, after the last one. And if not, well, I did my best. So let's go back to our, uh, our nice and, and complete uh, domain model, our very simple web shop as it uh, was introduced at uh, day one at our, uh, at our company. And uh, let's, let's do some queries. So, um, well, let's find the order, uh, the, the products that a customer has ordered. Well, that's rather simple, isn't it? I mean, we all know SQL, do we? And um, well, all we need to do is have some joins, and there's probably some foreign keys in there, and uh, a database will, will take care of it. So we have to join a few tables because there's a lot of data in between, but that doesn't matter. So we do three joins, and then we say where customer ID is customer ID. Well, fine, simple. Or is it? <laughs> what we might forget, even though we, we always say our business logic is in the service layer, we need to add some business logic to our queries as well, because not every order was maybe accepted. We might have orders in that list that were never confirmed by the customer or never approved by, by sales. So we have all this business logic in our queries. Now let's update a customer's address. Um, well, that's really easy as well. Any one of us can just type it like that. You can wake, you know, I can wake you up early in the morning, four o'clock, and say, give me the SQL query for this. Well, here we go. This is what we write. Really that simple. Or is it? Again, we have to think about what happens to existing invoices and orders. Don't they have a reference to this customer and then assume that that customer's address is the address that the order was sent to, or the invoice was or should be sent to. I've seen cases where this happened, and invoices were just, when you, you get them out of the system, you get an invoice in PDF format, because we are not allowed to change it. And then we change a customer's address, and we print another copy of the invoice, and suddenly there's a different address on it. I've seen it happen. I wasn't guilty, of course. Um, let's update uh, the price of a product. And I, I guess you get the hang of it. Um, we, have, we have a similar problem. Um, and I've seen this as well. Companies, year after year, making more profit in the year before. Because they update the price by about 10%. That's what happens. And suddenly, the management information would show that last year was a good year. If you checked it last week, it was 10% less. But now that we've upgraded our prices, last year was a really good year. And I, I think that's a very painful experience if, if you know that you're the developer that did that. Again, it wasn't me, but I hope that the guy who wrote that query starts, realized what, what he actually did. But the, the problem is that the domain model doesn't really help us there. Um, and there's another problem, is that we have different people, different kinds of people looking at our application, needing different types of information from our system. Uh, a few examples here. We have the order pickers, the people that 
uh, get the empty boxes and put all the uh, articles that you buy uh, in the boxes. Um, they need to know where to grab each uh, article from. And fast, because pressure is really on for the, for the order pickers. Um, finance wants to know what invoices are overdue. So who do we need to chase for money? Uh, management, well, all they want to know is what was my last year's revenue? And am I going to improve that this year? Um, and the customer wants to know where's my order? Right? Or what can I buy? How much will it cost? So that's all theory. Uh, let's go to some, uh, some practical example. I hope you can read it in the back. Um, <laughs> I actually hope you can't, because that was the whole point of it. Um, this is fortunately not the entire query. Don't worry. This is a uh, query where we uh, select information from three different tables, because we want to combine information on a very nice screen where you have sort of an overview of everything that's happening. So we do union. And of course, we do union all, because it's faster. Um, well, no, sorry. We do that because it's not as slow. Um, we um, put our portion of business logic in there because we have to, otherwise we get the wrong information. So we have to define, for every link between tables, we have to define only these cases, otherwise it means something else. And, and what this application did, or, or does, I actually don't know if they still exist, or well, with a query like that, I wonder. Um, this shows you an overview, or this application allows you to donate money to projects, to charity projects. And um, that's not enough, obviously, because there's Google and, uh, sorry, there's uh, Facebook and Hives, so they want that as well. So uh, you know that you have customers and they always want what, what Facebook has. Um, so there's friendships in there as well. So if a friend of yours donates money, your friend becomes cool. And of course, you want to be cool as well, so you donate money as well, and a bit more than your friend. So your friend gets this message that you've donated more. Well, that was the idea. Um, so this query, um, unfortunately, was not somewhere in the very back of the application where you could uh, find a, a, a sort of a side map that nobody ever visits, if they even still exist. No, this is the very first page when you come to their website. And they were wondering why performance was a bit slow. Um, what they really wanted was a query like this. Give me all the items that are relevant to this user. Period. That would have been a simple query. Updating would maybe be a bit more complex, because you have three sources of information where you have to update this. And you might have to store a bit more data, because you store it redundantly. But we know data storage is cheap. A lot cheaper than uh, having a customer wait for three seconds for the front page to appear. However, we use Ajax, so don't worry about it. So what we really want to do is the, to decouple these domain models. Think about these different audiences and different information needs separately and tackle one at a time. And make sure that each one of them, each one of these models, is optimized for that specific information need, for that specific task that a user executes. The problem then, if you have different models, is how do you keep them in sync? And obviously there's an answer to that, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here. Um, use events. So every time something changes in the command model, every time a user makes a change or requests a change to be made, we emit events to notify all the other components of what has changed. And they can update accordingly. Most applications have a read-to-write ratio, which is um, many to one. You read a lot and you write generally little. There are exceptions. And this approach will also help with those exceptions. So what you then get also is a very clearly defined API between the components. If you want to make a change, you send a command. And that can be <coughs> modeled as either an explicit object, if you're in an OO language, or it can just be modeled as a method call. You provide a method in your API to, to change something. 
And on the other side, on, we have events. And these events are used to notify components that something relevant has changed, something they might need to know to update themselves. And in practice, that combination of event-driven architecture and CQRS is what you see most. In fact, it's, it's so often combined that people are starting to believe, to believe that CQRS is an event-driven architectural approach. That's not entirely true. Well, it is true in 99% of the cases. So what we do is we have this client that sends commands to the cloud on the left. And uh, there it's executed in a command model. And that model emits events which updates the model on the right. So when the user starts doing queries for information, he can actually see the changes that he made, which is nice in most applications. A bit more detailed, it will look like this. Um, the um, UI will send a command, which is handled by a command handling component. That is a component that holds the domain model for the, for the command processing. And it will store that model in some storage. And it will publish events to notify other components of that change. And there will be event handling components that update these query models. And these query models are also stored in a storage. It doesn't have to be the same storage. In fact, in practice, it isn't the same storage. There will be a different storage for the command model. There will be different storages for the query model. If you use a search engine, for example, you're already using something like this because the search engine has, generally does not have operations you want the user to directly access. So there already is some transformation logic to transform to a uh, model that's optimized for, uh, for searching. Great. That's when technology leaves you. This is a, um, uh, these are a few graphs that uh, I was given by um, a company from, uh, from Italy, um, inspired by a graph that I drew because of, uh, based on gut feeling. And um, I said that a CQRS-based application is more complex when you're starting, because you have these different components. But my experience and gut feeling told me that when applications start to grow and time progresses, the complexity doesn't rise as much as it would with a traditional layered architecture. And um, some Italians wanted proof, so they started measuring in, uh, in sonar. And these are the graphs they came up with. And the, um, the gray boxes and lines are for a CQRS-based application, and the orange boxes are for a traditional application. So my gut feeling was, uh, in this case, is proven by, um, by their experience. But what they also noticed is that the complexity, especially the psychomatic complexity, um, was far less. And I told them, yeah, but this, you, know, you, you can easily manufacture this. All you need to do is tell the other project, give me a graph from before your refactor sprint. We do a quick refactor sprint to make our code beautiful. And then we, we compare the two. And he reassured me that that was not what they did. This is the organic uh, growth of the, of the application. So without extra efforts to, to make the code nicer. So it does make our applications on the long term a bit less complex. What it also provides by, by changing these, uh, these different storages is we can now suddenly capture history. History contains very vital information. And the amount of information that we throw away, so we don't give everything to Google. No, we throw a lot away. It's gone, never to be found again. Maybe by Google, but. What we can do in this, this command handling component is, since we are emitting these events, from things that, that are happening. What if we store all those events so we can use them for future reference? There is a lot of information in there. In our traditional approach, when we store state, um, 
let's go back to the cheesy example again. We have in our system an order. We have an order ID, and we have here uh, the information that um, a user bought one deluxe chair of 400 euros, and uh, the status of the order is return shipment received. So the customer sent it back. Okay, that's nice information. So there's information in here. We know that somebody bought the chair and sent it back. Great. If we were to use event sourcing, so instead of storing simple state, we store only the things that happened in the past. We would know that an order was created. Okay, interesting. We probably know that already. But we can see now that the user added two chairs to his shopping cart and then removed one and then sent the confirmation. The order was shipped and then the order was cancelled by the user. And then we got the return shipment. There's a lot more information in this version of, of storage. And in fact, companies like Amazon, uh, Google's not the only one storing masses of data. Uh, we also have Amazon. Every item you look at, uh, they remember. And in fact, you can use that to your advantage and just look at an item a few times and you're quite likely to, to receive an offer for that item with a discount. Because they know you're interested and they're just trying to get you over that ledge. Just trying to, you know, we've got an almost buyer here. Let's, let's convince him to buy the, uh, the item. So there's a lot of information in here that you, you can use in algorithms to define the behavior of a customer that is buying a product who is likely to send that product back. And maybe wait another day before shipping just to be sure you don't spend shipping costs on something that you'll get back later. And there's some, some other uh, scenarios where you can have advantages. And uh, we all know optimistic locking strategies. We've probably all used them. And they're really nice because they allow different users to work on the same data. But one of the two is not going to be very happy, especially if he makes a very big change and he tries to update a table and he says, well, sorry, but somebody else updated it before you and I'm not quite sure if that's going to conflict. So just try your operation again. In some cases you can automate that. And usually it's the case of users uh, telling a user, I'm sorry, but you know, review your changes. Here's the new data and make them again, just, just to be sure. Um, sorry. With event sourcing, you will know exactly what happened in the meantime. So you have more information to decide whether or not it is a conflicting change. And if it is a conflicting change, you even have the information to maybe merge these changes. So don't do exactly what the user asks, but do something similar that gives you the same end result, as if he was alone in the universe, at least in the context of this application. Uh, another uh, example is, um, and we probably all know this one. There's a, there's a manager that comes in and uh, he has some information needs. <coughs> there is a board meeting next week and I would like to know this and that. And we start creating these ad hoc queries. Um, and hopefully our system stores that data. Uh, quite often the system doesn't. Again, if we had event sourcing, we would know everything that happened in our application. So we could create a model that answers his uh, request and read the data from day one. So not only can you give him this year's numbers, but you can give him last year's as well. Don't tell your manager because now he'll start to ask information about five years ago and etc. Um, but actually I've heard managers come up to me and say, well, this, this event sourcing is fantastic. Why didn't we use it before? I don't know, and I hope they do realize there's a price as well. Because there must be a business case for event sourcing. Event sourcing is not something that we as, as technology eager people should, should use. Um, there is a cost to it and there's value to it and we should compare it. And that's not always easy. Um, so what are, what are the benefits? We have less information loss because we store everything that happened in our application. And we act on that history as well, making it a reliable source of information. 
So it's a reliable audit log as well. If an auditor comes in and he asks you, how did you come to this conclusion? You just do select star from my event store and here you go. This is how I got to the conclusion, good luck. And this is why this architecture is used in, in quite a, a lot of medical systems nowadays. Because then they have the history of what happened and an auditor is usually quite, quite happy with it. Um, you can increase performance in, when using event sourcing. Because instead of storing the state of massive objects, all we need to do is store little deltas. And in an event store, we can only append. Because we cannot change what happened in the past, we can only make new things happen. So we can use a database or a, any data store that is optimized for appending. File system. That's usually a very good database for appending. Um, and as I said, there's not only advantages, because when we store history, and history doesn't go away, it will only get longer. The further we progress in time, the more history we have to carry with us. And when you store states, you drop the history. But when you start carrying it along, you suddenly have a database that will only grow. And hopefully, the disk size will grow a bit faster, or the, at least the, the price of, of disk storage will grow not as fast as the amount of information that we store. So there's a cost there. But we also have to maintain that history. We have to be able to read the history. Otherwise, there's no value in it anymore if we don't know how to extract the information from it. So that's something to keep in mind. It's not a huge effort, but nonetheless one that should be uh, calculated. I already briefly touched on, uh, on performance. Let's go back to, uh, to this example. We've seen it several times now. And how do we isolate the performance bottlenecks here? So what if we have detected a performance problem in our application? How are we going to isolate that component so we can tackle the performance in there without having to bother with everything else? So let's assume that the performance problem is in the quoting and order creation system which is quite likely because that's probably the core business of this web shop. So how do we disconnect the order and the order item and the quote from all these connections that we have? Well, the answer is quite simple, you can't. Well, you can, but it will take you massive effort. Because there's all these queries all over the place that join that information together for managers, for order pickers, for all these different audience that we identified earlier. So what we need is a more, an, an approach that is more contained in that sense, that, that has these specific areas that we, um, that we work in, and they, they should be completely separate. Well, one way we do that is by separating the queries from the commands. So now suddenly we do our queries on different data models, which are optimized for queries, meaning simple queries, no joins, at least not too many of them. And we have a command component that's completely separate. Now we can start making very interesting decisions when we, we scale out or we scale up or, or whatever we need to do to, to address this, uh, this performance issue is that these components are decoupled. And the only information between them are the events. Now we can organize our command models to be more local in sense of data. So we can split them over multiple machines. And if you send a command that has to do something with orders or with a specific order, we are going to send that to this specific machine. Now that machine can hold a local cache so no more distributed caches, just a local cache with that order information to optimize executing that specific order. And when another order request comes in, it will probably go to another machine, which also has a local cache for it. So now we don't have to read any, any data from our, our big event log anymore. We can just only append new information just for future reference and emit events from there. It's a strategy quite common used in, uh, in, in trading applications. They take quick decisions 
and when they've made a decision, they emit an event, append a little entry to the, to the data log, and that's it. Well, as I said, simple queries run a lot faster. Um, I don't think that uh, needs any uh, more explanation. We all know SQL, and uh, we, uh, we know how to use indexes and make everything as fast as possible. So now we don't have to bother about how many updates we get. Updates will be executed. It's about the queries. They have to be fast because there's many of them. Maybe. Maybe there's very little of them. In that case, you optimize in a different way. So now let's go beyond the, uh, beyond the single box. There's, there's not many web applications nowadays that can really survive on a single box. Even though the boxes are really powerful, um, they fail. And they always fail, in this case, right before Christmas, when everybody wants to buy a product. Um, it, it's all the, the, the we, we have Murphy to blame for that. It's all his fault. Um, but a very important concept is that scalability is not the same as scaling. So I've, I've seen projects where people say, well, we have a very scalable product. Look, I've got my IDE here, and we have to launch seven applications to make it running. Yeah, that's a scaled application that probably doesn't need it, because there's probably one user on that entire system. And that's the guy between the back of his chair and his screen. Um, so there's a big difference between scalability and putting an application on two machines. And what is important is the ability to scale when time comes. Now what we can do to, to make this architecture scalable is actually quite simple. Is we make the result sending of a command and the emission of events, we make that asynchronous. Just don't assume that when I emit an event, that is being processed right away. Just assume it will be processed one day or another. Hopefully the next milliseconds, but it might be 10 milliseconds, it might be 100. It depends on whether we have scaled or not. And how have we scaled? Did we scale in a local data center? Did we scale across the globe? There are some applications that use this architecture that have command handling nodes in London and have query nodes in Singapore. Well, if you execute a command in London, it will take a while before your query appears, or that data appears in a query in Singapore. I think there's 200 milliseconds latency between London and Singapore. So that's 200 milliseconds. Well, we, we can probably live with that. And now, once that, is very, once that events mechanism is asynchronous, we can do very interesting things with our application. So we can put different contexts on different boxes. So what we can do is put the order stuff on a very big, fast box here on the left. We can put customer management on, a, on another box. We can put shipping on a, on a box and inventory on a box. And then we have an event bus to make sure that when something happens in the orders, that the event is also sent to the other boxes, just in case they need to do something with it. But now if we want to do something with an order, we're not bothered with a CPU that is currently busy processing stuff from the other context. And if that is not enough, we can decide to put the audiences on different boxes. So we can put the, um, the front-end services on, on a box. So, so people can really browse the, um, the, the catalog of your, uh, of your web shop really fast. Because that's what most people do. They just look around, right? Kijken, kijken, niet kopen. We all know that. Um, we could put the back end on different box and the reporting, you know, that's for the manager that just once in a year he wants to know the revenue of last year. So you can finally find some use for your old uh, 386 that you have in, uh, in the attic. Just take the dust off and it will be a great reporting machine. Make sure there's a network card in there. Uh, um, this architecture, as I said, is, is used in, not only in the medical industry but also in the, um, in the financial industry. And um, that's actually where this whole concept came from. It's from the uh, algorithmic trading. Um, but it's also used in other, let's say, 
uh, nanosecond critical uh, applications. And what we can do now is have, we can put these command handlers, this command model, we can put them on different boxes and efficiently route every command to a very specific box. And if we use consistent hashing for that, it can be really efficient. There needs to be almost no communication between the boxes, which is always nice. That means your, your network card can be, um, the resources of your network can be spent on valuable information. And we can route each, in this case, trade for every specific stock to exactly that machine where that stock is in the cache. And we know it's in the cache because that's the machine we always send our commands to. And in the case of consistent hashing, what happens if one box drops, the processing power of that box is then spread, or at least the load of that box is spread over the other boxes in equal. Um, equal. And that's quite powerful. That means you can also add boxes dynamically. Of course, you'll have some, some shares being moved from one machine to another, but the machine will, well, you have to warm the caches, but then it's really fast. Who knows the cap theorem? Uh, again, mistake. Who does not know the cap theorem? Oh, it's about half. It's, it's a very simple uh, theorem. There is, um, in a distributed application, there's three things you want, probably. There is consistency. So you want the two machines to have a consistent view on the data. So basically means they agree on what's there. The other one is availability. You want your data to be available, obviously. Um, and the third, third one is partition tolerance. If there is a network failure between these nodes, you still want the application as a whole to work. So that was the good news. The bad news is you cannot have them all, period. Um, you can, at most, choose two at the same time. and that, there's a little loophole. You can have two at the same time. But right after each other, you can have all three. Because that's not at the same time. It's just really close one after another. And, and th this is a, um, um, a theorem that pops up a lot, of, uh, a lot in, in databases. So we have this NoSQL movement that you probably all, uh, all heard of. And databases will always stick to a single area. And they have chosen two for you, and then you choose whether they are appropriate for your application or not. Um, SQL databases typically go for consistency and availability. If you have a master master setup of, let's say, MySQL, talking about open source, um, you, um, you do not have partition tolerance. If the net, there's a network failure between the two nodes, when it pops back up, MySQL will probably detect a conflict, and MySQL is very nice. It will gently wait for a human administrator to resolve the problem. And it's very patient. It will wait for days. Don't worry. And in the meantime, I will, just to be sure, I'll just not execute any updates. Because I don't know what I should do. So now that we've scaled, we can choose two different aspects of this CAP theorem for different aspects of our application. So we can choose consistency and availability for the command model, and maybe availability and partition tolerance for the query models. That means that the command model may not be consistent with the query model at all times, but there, with a slight delay, the query model at least in itself is consistent, and in a with a slight delay, it will be consistent with the command model. And that time of consistency is usually something we can live with uh, without any problems. Obviously, there's always a bit more of these complex tasks. You know, uh, when one context does something, I need another context to be updated. So if, if an order is shipped, I want to tell, or when an order is confirmed, I want to tell shipping because they need to ship those products to the customer. And I want to tell finance because they want to send an invoice to the customer. And there are components within the uh, CQRS and event-driven architecture called sagas that can manage those um, transactions. So they react on events and then tell other uh, systems to, to update accordingly. 
and they know about the process. So when this happens over here, then I need to do something over there. And if that fails, this is the way I can resolve it. Um, who is a Java developer? Okay, a bit uh, less than I hoped for, but a bit more than I was afraid of. Um, if you are a Java developer, um, or, or in fact a .NET developer as well, but this is about a Java framework. I, uh, a few years ago I, I, I read about this CQRS concept and I had the feeling that it was solving my problems. This, this was, it, it really put the finger on the sore spot, so to say. So I started doing a proof of concept. And that's where the web shop appeared. I decided to build a little web shop in my uh, one day a week um, research. And uh, this is what you could do. You could uh, browse products, you could place orders, you can update the inventory, because you buy new stuff, right? Um, and then uh, you can do, make some sales reports. Really simple. So I started, I was really enthusiastic, you know, cool, I've got this, uh, I've, I, I really feel I'm solving all of my problems. Um, so I did some development and I wrote a few lines of code. Zero lines of business logic code. I mean, this probably happens in every project. You have to set up and in, 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 um, in Java, that's, uh, it takes a while to, to get started. So the second day, I had dozens of lines of code and still no business logic. Third day, hundreds of lines of code, still no business logic. And then I realized that what I've built was a generic infrastructure. So I've built something that since there was no line of business logic code, then probably everybody who is going to build an application using this architecture is going to hit the same problem. They have to build all this stuff before you can really get started. So, um, I'm sorry, I gave it to Google. I put it on Google Code and um, gave it a name because you have to. And I'll see you all. Let's see what happens. You know, if somebody's interested, I need a place to store my code, so why not do it in a place where everybody can see it and contribute to it? And then suddenly some, some strange French guy, I'm sorry, are there any French guys in here? Um, he suddenly said, uh, well, this is a really cool framework and we're using it in production. What? <laughs> Don't. I mean, it's, it's, it's a proof of concept. Don't use it in production. Um, they are actually still using it in production. Well, they've moved a few versions further now. Um, but suddenly it struck me, I've got, oh shit, I've got a framework that I'm maintaining. And they're using it in production. And not just an application, it was a medical application. So if I screw up, uh, people are being treated uh, with surgical tools that might not have been properly cleaned. Hmm, that's, uh, so now I, here I am, 24-7, writing code, making sure that people have clean surgery um, when they uh, have to go to the hospital. So the Axon framework, uh, as it was, was called <coughs> later on, is a uh, Java-based framework for, uh, for CQRS-based applications. And it gives you the basic building blocks, like a command bus, so you can send the commands, and uh, an event bus. And there's always multiple imp implementations of everything, so you can choose a very simple uh, implementation where you're, when you're working on your own laptop, so you don't have to scale, you keep it all simple. But when you decide to scale, all you have to do is swap the infrastructural blocks to the distributed ones, and then suddenly you can scale. And um, that was at least a theory. Then a, a customer told me, well, here's our code base. You proved to me that you can make this scale without us changing any of the business logic. And it took me two days, and then they had a linearly scalable uh, application. So it is actually possible. And rather simple as well. All you need to do is change the infrastructural uh, building blocks. Um, so it really separates the, uh, the infrastructure components from the business logic components. And in fact, what I try to do is stay away from the business logic as much as possible. So Axon will only provide the infrastructural components and you decide how to fill in the blanks with your business value. So these are some examples, so there's some asynchronous uh, stuff, but there's also uh, a nice one is a, a disruptor command bus. And disruptor is a framework built by a uh, British trading company uh, that is building an algorithmic trading application in Java. 
And why would you want to do that? There's garbage collections and all nasty stuff that uh, don't perform very well, and Java really sucks, doesn't it, in performance? Well, they're going, they have proven it doesn't. And um, they've created this project called the Disruptor, which is a lockless algorithm for processing um, data off a queue. Um, just to compare, the simple command bus on my, on my not too extremely fast laptop does about 400 commands per second. And when I changed to the Disruptor command bus, I went to 1.4 million per second. So there's a slight improvement there. Same for events. You can use a simple event bus, which uses everything in process, which is really nice when you're developing. Um, so you can debug right through your code. You don't have to worry about different threads picking things up. Um, and then there's an advanced uh, event bus where you can just configure whatever you want. Um, for those uh, few Java developers here, if you, you, you can either love annotations or hate them. If you love them, you can actually use them and just annotate some of the methods that you want Axon to, to recognize. So all you need to do to build an event handler is in your class, put an annotation on your method, and then suddenly, magically, all your events are sent to that method. Of course, there's no magic. Um, sagas as well. Sagas can be rather complex. They, they, they manage these really complex transactions between different contexts. Um, with Axon, you can simply add annotations again, and Axon will make sure that everything runs threat in a thread-safe manner, uh, that only the correct instances of this class are, are invoked. Um, so you don't have, when you have a million transactions, not every event has to go to each of these one million instances. Uh, it will select the right one and, and execute it for you. Another feature is declarative testing. Since we have this command component that has a clearly defined API, it takes commands in and publishes events, we can define our test cases using only these events and commands, which are functional building blocks. So regardless of our technical decisions, we can define a test case where we say, well, if I have done this in the past, some events, when I execute a, in this case, update credit, customer credit limit, then I expect this command, uh, this event to appear. Now we have a question, yeah? Oh, five minutes, sorry. Um, as I said, Axon is being used in production a little bit earlier than I, uh, than I anticipated. Um, it's being used in, uh, in finance. Um, there's a, a very large bank, of which the name may not be mentioned, uh, that is using it for process automation, which is really nice. Um, it is being used for, for trading to make the rich people richer. Glad to contribute to that. Um, there's a uh, pension fund calculator in one uh, very large Dutch bank. Um, and I believe I'm allowed to mention their name there, ABN AMRO. Uh, so if you have a pension in ABN AMRO, um, thank Axon for, uh, for processing them. Uh, it's also being used for online payment processing, and there's many examples. Uh, uh, it's also being used in online gaming, which is a bit more fun, um, and in the healthcare because of the auditing, uh, auditing principles. If you want to use Axon in your project, those few Java developers here, if you use Maven, it's really simple. It's, it's open source, otherwise I wouldn't be here, I guess. Um, Apache 2 licensed, so it's as open as you can have it, almost. Uh, just uh, if you make some changes, I'll uh, gladly receive a pull request on, uh, on GitHub. Yes, I moved away from Google. And um, you can even uh, check out the sources and build it from there if you want. Whoops. There's probably three minutes left for questions. Do we have a question? <laughs> Yeah, so the question is basically that um, it all looks really nice with these components and events updating. What happens if to either a bug or a system failure and events gets, uh, gets dropped? Um, well, 
The easy answer is make sure that events don't get dropped. That's the easy answer, but probably a very difficult implementation. Um, there are actually very easy ways to, uh, to resolve that, and there are uh, message queues that you can use that use persistent, uh, use a persistent queue. So if the, if the message broker drops, uh, it will have everything on disk, uh, everything is transactional. So you'll, you'll split everything between more local transactions. And these queues can guarantee delivery, either at most once or at least once. So the question would not be, what if I lose an event? But then suddenly the question is, what if I get an event twice? Which is a more luxury position. Um, so, so that's usually the approach that, that people take as a first step. Um, there are ways if you use purely event sourcing, or your events are in the event store. So you can simply have the query models read from the event store, and when the connection drops and reconnects, they can take off where they left and continue reading from there. So those are just a few ways to, to make sure that the query model, one, at one point or another, will be up to date with the command model. Does that answer your question? We don't make bugs, right? <laughs> this is being recorded, so we don't make bugs. We're not going to publicly say we create bugs. Okay, it occasionally our colleagues make, make sure. bugs, right? Yeah, that's what happens. Um, now, what, what happens in fact is yes, then you get out of sync. Um, and there's a few ways to do it. I mean, how would you do it nowadays with the architecture? You just go to the database, you, you fix it. You do an update query, ad hoc query to fix it. Um, now, if you use at least if you use event sourcing, because if you don't, then that's your option. If you also use event sourcing, you can decide to throw away your entire query model after you fix the bug, obviously, and then replay from the start. It might take an hour, might take two hours, depending on how big history is, um, but at least you can fix it. So you have two options now. So you can decide, do we have a dirty fix right in the database, or do we want to do the clean, auditable fix where we reread from, from the start? <laughs> well, but you, the, the monitoring is there's an event handler that throws an exception. That's your monitoring. So a problem appears in this event handler that we did not expect. Yeah so, the, yeah, so the question or uh, remark is that there is no way or, or is there a way to detect that these models are out of sync? Um, and that really depends on, on the type of application that you have. What they do in the uh, trading applications, um, and I, I forgot the word for it, um, but basically it means sometimes you check the command model and you check the query model to see if there's differences. And then you check the queue to see if there's messages that it can give a, an explanation to those differences. Um, that's what they generally do at uh, financial institutions. They just check the left side and they check the right side and see whether at the bottom there's the same number. And if it's not, you take your pen and you start crossing out all the, all the transactions. So basically that's, uh, that would be a way. Um, in practice, people build the application, assume that the event bus will transport every event at least to every handler and anomalies are discovered by, by humans using the application and wondering why specific information is, is different. That's in practice, what I see mostly in practice. Do we have time for a last question? So you can choose, it's either lunch or a question. Let's uh, do the, the question uh, during lunch. Um, if you uh, want to uh, ask some more questions, I'm just around the corner here at the Trifork stand. And uh, otherwise, uh, thank you very much.